anyway, over all, all the years that I've been in the classroom, I would have to say, if I had to put my finger on one thing that I believe works over and over again for me, and it's not just for me, I've seen other teachers do this, it's doing anecdotes in the classroom, okay? Um, so, what I want to do is basically get through three questions. First of all, what is an anecdote? Try and define it. Um, how do you set one up? So some practical uh, suggestions and some practical considerations. And then, why does repeating anecdotes work? What is it in the repetition of uh, anecdotes that, uh, that gives the, the students um, uh, a greater opportunity to, to learn the language? But I'd like to, I'd like to just look uh, a bit, in a bit more detail about what an anecdote is. The dictionary defines it as a story that you tell people about something interesting or funny that has happened to you, okay? And that is the dictionary definition. Most dictionaries will have something like that. Indeed, it's a, a cognate of a lot of European languages. Um, anecdota in Spanish is something very similar. The idea of interesting, the idea of funny, and the idea definitely of a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, what we believe an anecdote is in, in the classroom, if you want to turn it into a piece of ELT jargon, is um, an extended speaking turn, if you like. Um, so it's not necessarily a story, and it's not necessarily interesting, and it's not necessarily funny, but it's a, it's a long turn. Um, it, it, it's not either something more formal, like a kind of presentation in front of the whole class, or um, uh, you know, some kind of speech. It, it's not that. It's students in pairs, and one of them has a go at speaking at length about something. But the something must be something which belongs to their life experience. That's the key. It's not something you've given them to talk about. You may have given them the topic, but you've only given them the topic because you believe that they have something to say about it. Okay. So it's choosing, in a sense, rather mundane things. Your favorite subject at school. You all did that. Why? Because you all had, I knew, I second guessed, that you all had a favorite subject at school. Okay, so I could imagine that's a good starting point. I'll now develop some questions and get you to talk about it. Somebody who's important to you. Everybody always speaks about their mum, never their dad. I don't know why that is. Uh, blockbuster movie you've seen, a delicious meal you've enjoyed. These are very mundane, ordinary topics. I'll, I'll list a whole load at the end of the sorts of things that we do. But the key point is that they, uh, it's the realization, as I'm sure a lot of you know, the most precious resource that comes into your classroom is not you, the teacher, it's not necessarily the textbook, although this is a very good one, it's the students. What the students bring into the classroom, their experiences, their thoughts, their ideas, their beliefs, their knowledge, this is what we have to tap into, it seems to me, and this is what we have to try and build our lessons around. So it's getting that information out, because we don't want to be too worried about what they're talking about, we want to concentrate more on how they're delivering it. Yes, that's our job. So that they deliver their own content in as, as a good a way as possible. Okay? But there needs to be some way of dragging the memory up. You know it's in there, but you have to access it. So the idea of um, thinking about a topic and then writing maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten questions not only will help bring the memory forward, but of course it will also give a kind of structure to the talk. So it's like a framework, which then allows the students to not just come out with any old rubbish at random, but structure what they're going to say. Now you don't want them to use this and have an ar a question answer session. It's definitely just to write notes or just to get thinking. But um, the thing about the, the fluency always improves the thing about the accuracy, as I said, a bit of a double-edged sword because in a sense the second time being slightly more adventurous, the student is on the edge of their language competence. So they are making, if you like, higher class mistakes, more mistakes but they're better quality, if you see what I mean, uh, because they're striving to improve the way that they express themselves, so using language which is which is slightly more uh, different. And, and, and that is what we want. We want the students to kind of move from this level of complexity to the next level of complexity. So I think there's an awful lot to be said um, for doing anecdotes. Now, why does it work? Well, um, one of the obvious things, this is a quote from the literature again, Scott Thornbury, getting the learner to repeat the task is a way of producing more grammatically complex language. Having done the activity once, 
as a kind of rehearsal, learners now have more spare time to devote to the form of their output. And that's what happens. It's the kind of thing that we all know. Everybody has their own set piece, their joke, their uh, thing that happened to them on the holiday, or whatever it is. And you tell it once, you tell it a second time, you tell it a third time. Each time you tell it, it gets better. So I would uh, end, I think, by just giving you um, a summary of what I think uh, is a successful way of doing anecdotes. Firstly, choose the global topic that everybody can relate to. Remember, you're dealing with the raw material that's within the student. That's the key. Allow sufficient preparation time. Firstly, for them to be able to access their memory bank. Secondly, to think about the actual language they'll need. Thirdly, we haven't really got into this, but monitor students and give feedback. This is, provide opportunities for students to listen to a proficient speaker doing the same anecdote. This, of course, is, is part of the task cycle. I mean, the, the purists, uh, if you like, would probably put the students into the deep end first off, get them to do the task, they mess it up, then have a model, and then get the students to do it again, having listened to the model, they'd be more attuned to what was necessary, how they could improve it. Yeah? But maybe you want to provide the model first. The best model is always going to be you, as the teacher. Okay? And finally, and most importantly, give students the chance to repeat the same anecdote with a new partner. Have I ever told you about my favorite subject at school? Yes, 10 times. No, we don't want that, okay? <laughs> so we want the students to move around, and again, this requires classroom management, but you need to get to the stage where you can uh, put the students with different partners so that they can repeat the same anecdote, okay? So that is what I would suggest is um, uh, a, uh, a possible task cycle for anecdotes. Um, these are some of the um, anecdotes we've, we've done. They're all, as you can see, pretty, pretty simple stuff. Um, and um, I think that's uh, some of the further reading that you might be interested in. These are uh, books that have influenced me, certainly, and, and ourselves in, in writing and, and developing anecdotes. But I think uh, I can finish on time. It's the first time I've ever done that.